Thank you all for taking the time and attending today's webinar. Uh, let me have a quick intro of uh, myself and Kitty. So my name is Gayatri. Most people call me Guy, and uh, I had technology at my other systems. I've been in the industry uh, for about 20 plus years now. And though I started my career with IBM in the IBM ICS arena, over the last few years, I've been uh, expanding the scope and uh, working with multiple technologies, inclusive of Microsoft uh, Office 365, Java, .NET, and, and a few others as well. Um, hope you enjoyed today's webinar. Katie? Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to today's session of uh, migration to Office 365. My name is uh, Katie Nagraj. So, shortly they call Katie. So I work as a, a subject motor exercise for uh, Office 365 mail migration at Marga. And I have 17 years of experience uh, in messaging as well as uh, um, my. So I started with the Lotus Notes uh, administration and architecture. Then now I am uh, working on the migration of uh, Lotus Notes to Office 365. So my main skill is uh, migration of mails, uh, mail system from uh, different systems to the Office 365. I hope you will have a very nice um, presentation and information informative. Thanks, Katie. A quick intro to Marga. Um, we are a boutique consultancy, almost about 14 years old, and uh, customers spread across uh, US, Europe, and uh, a little bit in India as well. We focus a lot on workflow and collaboration areas. From a technology stack, it is IBM ICS, then Office 365. Of course, we do work with Java and .NET, especially when we uh, work on the workflow side. We've been uh, working with quite a few customers on digital transformation of their applications, um, focusing a lot on cloud architectures as well as JavaScript-based uh, new development as well. So that's just a very quick intro to what Marga does. So we'll start off by going through a quick poll so that I get a sense of um, the audience today who so joined us. So Scott, if you could run poll one. Okay, here's the first poll. So the poll is, what role do you play in your organization? Are you an IT management role, a technical specialist in IBM Notes, or a technical specialist in Office 365, system administrator, or another role? And this shouldn't surprise any of us here, uh, since this is a uh, webinar hosted by Notes Code that the majority of us will be in Notes and still scratching our heads why uh, IBM has allowed the email <laughs> world to go another way. But here we go. All right, so almost all of us have voted. Let me share the results. So 27% of us are in IT management role, 64% of us are technical specialists in IBM Notes, and 9% have other uh, responsibility. Not uh, surprising results, right? Most people come from that background. And, I, and I'm sure like a lot of you are interested in also understanding how do you um, take your organization, especially if there have been decisions on migration already made, how do you do it in a seamless manner? Okay, so today's takeaway from the webinar, and uh, thankfully the target audience is meant for the, uh, the nurse administration folks as well as IT manager folks, which looks like almost um, ninety percent of the audience is. So the idea is to look at how whether you have just started planning or you're ongoing, how do you make your email migration process seamless? How do you can how can you make it uh, as well planned as possible, giving a very pleasant experience to your end users? So we talk about strategies, we talk about factors that could potentially affect the overall migration. We talk about planning for it, and we also talk a little bit about uh, adoption of uh, 
the new platform, though we do have one of the uh, focused uh, webinar on adoption coming up next. But today we will touch upon the uh, topic of adoption as well. So getting uh, started, I would like to understand where you are in your migration journey. So very quickly, Scott, run the poll too. These are more for me to understand the audience. Okay, poll two is up on the screens. Where are you in your migration journey? So are you preparing to migrate email? Is your mail migration in progress? Have you migrated your mail and planning to migrate applications or planning to cloud enable IBM notes or none of the above? This one's going to be a little bit interesting. All right, almost all of us have voted again already, so that's good. Thank you for uh, prompt replies here. Okay, so I'm going to share the results. 67% uh, of us say preparing to migrate mail, and 33% have uh, no plans to do any of these items at the moment. Okay, that's interesting. At least 70% are going to um, fairly benefit from today's webinar, I hope, because we are going to talk a lot about um, the planning process or preparing a preparation process, and hopefully uh, you would be have, able to take some key takeaways from today's webinar. Thank you for uh, answering that poll. So we start off straight away with what are those factors that you need to kind of consider as you are going on this journey. It's just, um, I'm sure there are times where it was just a mandate that handed over and said, everyone's going to Office 365, we need to move too. And let's get it done as quickly as possible. And that's what typically we hear from our customers. And then we start off with, hey, wait on. Let's put together all the things that you need to know and have in, in place in terms of data before you actually embark on this journey. And here are some of the top factors that we have seen. First is the scope of migration. Um, what we mean by that is, are you only talking about email? Are you talking about emails and some common applications? Are you talking about emails common? I, I, know I want to be in a situation where my entire domino infrastructure can be shut down by a particular date. These are different ways of looking at what you want to achieve at the end of it. And that becomes a very important factor for uh, going through this entire process. The second is critically the size of the environment, um, which is the number of users, the number of mailboxes, uh, the size of your mailboxes, and uh, we'll talk a little bit more about it just in a little bit. The organization's context, we do know of some organizations that have very, very deep uh, penetration of the IBM Notes platform. You know, it's, it's used for email, it's used for calendaring, it's used for applications, applications that integrate with line of business applications, uh, you know, it integrates with systems of record like SAP, and sometimes um, we've seen organizations that completely run their entire uh, business out of notes-based applications, right? Their core line of business applications are also running on notes, and their email itself is integrated in many different ways. And each of this adds different layers of complexity when you actually want to get off of this platform. Uh, it has to be addressed. The infrastructure itself, how complex the infrastructure could be. And I'm sure all of you know that, you know, especially where the infrastructure has been around for, say, 15 years, you could find clusters, you could find many different domains, you will have uh, things like, you know, there might be a SaaS server hanging around in one corner doing its own job, and many such case, uh, functionalities just around. And if you are a global organization with many different countries, then you could be centrally located or you could have servers in each country all replicating to each other. And these do make a difference when you're actually planning for your entire migration process. We have had a customer who had walked in and said, you know what, I want to be off of my notes platform for email by a particular date, and the date was about six months away, and said, no, I want to be closing down by March 31st of that particular year, and I don't want to have any of my mail servers around. And if you have such hard deadlines, 
it does make a difference as to what you would uh, plan for and how you will go about it. And of course, do you have the resources, whether it's the uh, human resources, whether it is the infrastructure resources, whether it is uh, the overall uh, capability to do change management, how well are these resources available? So that kind of guides through the entire process of migration. Now, one thing that I want to um, tell the audience is if you have been like, you know, working towards this entire process of preparation and you have some factors that you consider and you would like to share with the rest of them, please feel free to add it into the chat box uh, on the webinar. And when we're talking about questions and things like that, we'll share it with the rest of the audience and it could be a great way to collaborate as well. So, um, one of the things I want to ask Katie, Katie, I know you've been working on multiple such migrations over the last few years. Can you touch upon, you know, how does the size of the environment and the infrastructure complexity really, I, I feel they play a big role in the overall migration process. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so when, when we do the migration of from one system to other system, uh, size of the mailbox and and where the mailboxes are present and and where what do you want to do with that uh, mailboxes so currently you may have mailboxes uh, with a lot very big size which cannot pay and handle very easily from the migration process so we need to identify the large mailboxes and uh, large attachments and then we need to plan uh, and see how we can uh, you know optimize or split or, or do something about that before we we actually decide um, the complete migration of the mailboxes so this size plays a very important role so my my past experience says that uh, there are customers okay they say okay we will migrate only f few mails and then they they also plan to keep some mails on the on premises so this this needs to be considered how the overall uh, size of the data and how much data you have kept in in the existing environment so that it will not impact uh, um, you know end users experience and as well as minimize the you know network impact also we can consider the archiving data of the old mails so we can also i can talk about this complexity as uh, this lotus notes and office 365 are two different technologies so it's it's it will, it will definitely have some complexities when you try to do the you know integration or migration so we need to identify uh, how the current existing infrastructure is uh, where the domino servers are located uh, and the number of uh, locations and and the existing uh, network connectivity you know is there any third party tools used like a fax server because if if you are running a fax server on on premises and when you move to office 365 so that that will fail to you know with office 365 so we need to identify such uh, uh, applications uh, and maybe there could be some applications which are required in, in on-premises only like because of legal or technical complications you know particularly for companies uh, that have complex and large number of uh, mission critical workflow applications those applications to be identified and then we need to consider uh, these applications uh, when we when we you know go for a migration of office 36 office 365 that's right and one of the key things that we also notice is um, how do you handle and this is again very common um, in in organizations that use notes also for applications so usually you get an email and then there are uh, applications that take off of the email you know it, it is treated as a mailing database and from a mailing database uh, an application just takes off of it and quite often we see that uh, people are reluctant to 
such such application as part of the email migration so there is usually a step of remediation just making sure that nothing would break in terms of the business critical applications whether it is on domino or non domino applications just to make sure that nothing is going to break because the emails are moving away and we've seen that one of those steps that come in as a preparation or a prior preparation is also to ensure that uh, these things will not break so based on some of these factors what we see is um, people get to a point of picking a strategy to migrate and this is more like you know uh, deciding number one is going for a cutover so i know of a customer of ours who had a very small number of users about uh, i think 350 or so and all they decided to do was um, create an office 365 day so to speak and not too many locations as well and most of them were in the us i think four locations in us and they just decided that one particular day a particular time they would decide to cut over to the new platform and they decided to spend half a day where on the floor everyone was involved in this right everyone shifted over to office at the same time and there were uh, it support team members who were available to kind of help these users and help them also adopt to the new technology and things like that and that that is one method that's available just cut over from um, your existing platform to a new platform you could plan for a completely staged migration wherein um, it's all phased out and whether it is by business units or whether it's by countries you could choose and then onboard users at different points in time and we do see customers also seeing about the hybrid uh, migration model this is primarily with respect to exchange because we see some of these um, especially in the healthcare industry they have a lot of uh, legal requirements and sometimes they want to retain some of their mailboxes on prem so they go through a two stage process they migrate into exchange on prem and then um retain just what they want to retain on uh, on uh, exchange platform and the rest moves into office 365 so all three are possibilities now the key thing that we need to understand is that each of these uh, have advantages and limitations so katie why don't you talk a little bit about some of the uh, limitations and some more, some some more recommendations in terms of which of these strategies uh, we've seen working well yeah so uh, let me start with uh, this way um, we need to choose uh, the correct um, you know method or uh, strategy for moving from uh, you know one system to other system uh, this is the first thing it it will be very critical uh, uh, decision Uh, and and we need to plan and think and how we going to do and how what is the best uh, best method to do that so if if we are, if i talk about the cutover migration um, it will be good for you know organizations which are smaller or it could be good for a specific team in a larger organizations maybe say 1500 to 2000 users yes it will work out Uh, in a better fashion and it will be in a big bang and you all of a sudden you all move to the you know cloud but there will be a limitations or you need to consider before you proceed or you decide uh, such a process or a such a strategy uh, when you go for a cutover migration you know you, you need to be 100% sure that you have all the data synchronized or you know you are, you have migrated all the data to the cloud before you you do the switch you know during this uh, migration process so users may experience uh, you know downtime or they could not able to connect and access it also you need to consider that um, if you are uh, uh, doing say 1000 mailboxes you need to estimate and see how much time it will take to migrate it because it it may have a large number of attachments and then 
your your migration may not be you know complete in expected timelines and then you will extend more downtime for the users so these are the things we need to consider if you choose uh, you know the cutover migration so if you go for a staged migration uh, the staged migration is uh, you know it, it's we will do the migration in batches okay and then will not have much of an impact uh, for all the users, but it will it may impact for a few users very rarely because we are doing batches and you have flexibility of doing migrations from say you can do 100 or you can do 300. So this way, this stage migration is a, a best fit for uh, migrating a large number of uh, users in a stage uh, fashion. Uh, this also gives uh, users, you know, ability uh, for, uh, you know, uninterrupted service and as well as, uh, you know, good experience to the users. And also it keeps, uh, you know, less load on the IT because we, we are not touching all the users. So we have flexibility to plan and do the uh, migration of in the stage manner. The only the diff, only the limitation with this stage migration is that uh, you know you need to do so, some of the additional activities to manage and do the migration for quite some time. So that's the only downside of it. But otherwise, uh, most of the large organizations, you know, they prefer to go for um, stage migration. So let me talk about the hybrid. Now the hybrid migration is, uh, is some special case where uh, some clients customer wants to keep uh, some of the data on premises so that uh, they migrate the data to the exchange and then from exchange uh, they're going to migrate it to the office 365 so they will end up using both uh, you know exchange server in the on premises and then uh, office 365 so that's how the it, it could be a reason that okay they want to keep some users or some mails on the on premises so it, it it will be requirement for some compliance or maybe legal requirement so that will make that we need to go for a hybrid but this will have some implications as well because you have to maintain both systems uh, in the future like you need to maintain and you need to license so these are the recommendations or, or situations where you consider uh, for migration strategies. Right, and, and also I've seen hybrid come up in organizations that probably has an existing exchange infrastructure. So, you know, either due to mergers or acquisitions or uh, whatever reason, if a part of the organization is already using exchange, those are also cases that I have seen that it's a, it's a consolidated move to uh, Office 365, but people move from nodes to Exchange and then Exchange onto Office 365. So that's another uh, time they've seen that. So now, once somehow you kind of analyze your factors, what it is going to be, and which of these strategies make sense, and as Katie put it, uh, especially in the last, um, some of the last two years, any of our large customers that we are seeing is going in for a staged migration, if, if they can plan it out well enough, uh, then you get started with actually doing the plan, right? Now, what is the very first step B? Is to form a core team. Now, we've seen that sometimes this is the difference between success and failure having a, at least a small core team that for whom this is a very, very critical activity and they are not um, distracted by other, other, other things. Also, because this is, a, this is a complete program, so you need to have the ability to coordinate with multiple parts of the organization and you also need to have differential skills in the organization to be able to do that. I mean, you do definitely need the node skills uh, while you're migrating, you need Office 365 skills. You also need fairly good capability of interacting with the network teams and things like that, and uh, also with your communication team. 
So we find that having a core team drives this work a lot. Choosing the tools, I mean, almost any large organization cannot migrate without going for the tools. Now it's just, uh, uh, and, and there are many tools. So we've seen um, binary tree, quest, and uh, many tools in the market. So maybe, um, Katie, why don't you tell us a little bit about, uh, uh, I think the last migration that you guys did uh, for this larger customer was using binary tree, right? Now, uh, why did you choose binary tree and what were some of the um, advantages that you got when choosing that? Yeah, so for migration of uh, data or to have the coexistence uh, between uh, Lotus Notes and uh, Office 365, we need to use uh, the third party tools. So there are some four or five, uh, the Microsoft recommended tools, and there are a couple of uh, tools uh, which are in market, uh, which will provide uh, some capabilities, but not uh, it, uh, full um, capabilities uh, as Microsoft uh, recommended or, or preferred tools, what you say. So if you, if you are not interested or you say that, okay, we just want to migrate only data, then you can go for a tools which are not recommended by the Microsoft. But if you want to say, uh, migrate the data as well as, uh, you know, uh, have the free busy and mail flow, and you have all the, you know, the email uh, body and email information is kept and workflow information is, uh, in, in, is kept as it is. So the recommendation was to use one of the, uh, you know, the Microsoft recommended tools. In my experience in, in the last project, um, uh, we, we did all the, you know, Microsoft recommended um, uh, tools analysis and, and uh, testing and throttling based on that experience and our testing. The binary tree, which is um, uh, preferred uh, the, or the what is a Microsoft uh, uh, used, even the binary tree is used in their Microsoft uh, migration projects. Uh, our test shows that the binary tree is provides a good stability and uh, you know data migration as well as uh, effective way of handling uh, mail flow and free busy information so that's the reason we we have chosen uh, the binary tree after evaluating testing uh, and uh, pilot uh, piloting multiple users uh, for the migration and and right. apart from mm -hmm. Uh, hey, thanks, uh, Katie, on that. And I know I think you wanted to also talk about Quest. Quest is definitely another uh, tool that we've seen uh, available in the market, and uh, that's also used uh, uh, in 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 a few places that we have seen. So moving on, um, we wanted to talk a little bit about this uh, change management and communication plan. As I said, this is a program, and uh, it's not easy for users to shift over. In fact, um, we've seen in a, it, is a, it, it was a small organization, not a very large organization, but they did have a core group of uh, what we call as uh, master users of uh, Lotus Notes. Like they were fairly experts, uh, not IT folks, but business folks, but they, they had really figured out how to use it very well. And there was resistance. Um, in terms of how do I uh, move and why should I move and things like that. So it really helps to plan uh, out a communication, um, how are we going to address these uh, issues that are going to come up, and overall change management as well, uh, making sure that the different parts of the organization know that what is coming up and approvals and things like that can be addressed ahead of time. Definitely, it's going to be important to set up the infrastructure right. And uh, I'm definitely going to, uh, I want Katie to uh, talk specifically about AD and ADFS and why that's so critical because I know we've seen some challenges there. Um, Katie, can you talk about setting up the infrastructure for uh, the migration and also the, you know, how, how important it is to do the pilot? 
yes um, for for migration setup so we need to prepare uh, the existing you know uh, the active directory so we need to prepare active directory so that the active directory in in, in a good condition for using uh, you know on uh, setting up for office 365 environment so we need to um, set up aad connect uh, which will uh, synchronize all the AD users uh, to the Office 365 uh, and also we need to set up ADFS um, services so that uh, you know users will have a uh, you know single sign-on uh, facility available uh, when we when we think about the setting of the AD connect we need to see how good uh, is AD, whether you have a, only one domain or you have uh, multiple domains uh, and, and you need to uh, see on which domain uh, you, you want to set up the you know, AD connect and, and how you plan to synchronize the objects from on-premises to the Office 365 so that uh, it can uh, be used for uh, a single sign-on authentication with Office 365. So apart from uh, uh, this uh, infrastructure setup, we need to also consider the network bandwidth for migration. So we have talked about uh, three different uh, types of uh, migrations that is cut over and uh, st uh, staged and uh, hybrid so if you going for um, a cut over so this bandwidth plays a very important role because you need to do or move the uh, large data in a very short time so we need to plan how you going to do the networking and also you need to also see how the future networking will look like if if all the users are uh, moved to the cloud and, and you need to uh, analyze and calculate and then decide okay how much bandwidth uh, is required to use office 365 services like outlook skype and uh, other services and the other thing is that when when you say in between the uh, migration so we need to still keep all the migration infrastructure uh, you know ready and up and running till you complete all the data so do not consider you know say okay you completed 70 percent okay i'll take off one two servers from the migration infrastructure so it, it should be planned and then you should you should remove all the infrastructure once you complete uh, migration is done Perfect, perfect. So I think the other aspect I think we've also seen is the, uh, especially when it comes down to the um, setting up of AD, is also the naming conventions, right, Katie? Because sometimes we've seen uh, some of the critical information that you need when you actually move to Office 65 is not set up correctly. So it, it kind of helps if you do one round of cleanup as well, a cleanup activity that uh, ensures that all your users are identified and uh, tagged and you know have the correct way in terms of their email addresses and things like that. Uh, and it, it helps a lot when you go forward. The other aspect also I wanted to bring out is not all organizations might have AD. If you're using something else, then you will have to set AD up because from a Microsoft perspective, that's what they use in terms of connecting from on-prem to Office 365 and setting everything up. And if you're using a, a go to go for a staged migration and things like that, definitely you would need to set that up. So add that as a task into your uh, list. Uh, if you are not using AD at all, then that also becomes a, a task to do. The rest of the uh, high-level plan in terms of identifying users and testing the environment is probably something that you do for any kind of uh, major project, so I'm not stepping detailed into it. Let me ask the audience question here, not so much a poll. What, what do you think uh, is how long is this process going to take? What are thoughts? What do you people think? I mean, feel free to put it up in the chat message and uh, I will take a look at it and pass it on to other people as well if, if people are uh, typing it in. I'm not seeing any uh, much of a response here, but uh, believe me, I've heard someone come and ask us 
and say, you know what, we are not so big, it's just about uh, 7,000 users. Do you think we can just get it done in a couple of months? Um, and some unrealistic expectations also being set up, right? It really determines, it, it, it goes much, much smoother if you allow for a reasonable amount of time for the pilot. Just going through the factors and deciding the strategy and allowing for a reasonable amount of uh, pilot really helps when you are uh, going through this process. One of our customers, uh, about 50,000 users across the globe, uh, 100 plus countries, they took eight months just for planning and pilot. But of course, the entire migration then after that was completed within a matter of about 18 months. Uh, all the countries with all the users and with, with pretty much no major catastrophic issues that was, uh, that was uh, coming up. And that, that really helps uh, doing a pilot. As Katie said right up front, the amount of data to be migrated and the type of data to be migrated. So more attachments might take more time. Um, where even, even though you may have a lot of emails but not as much attachments may not have such an impact. One of the things that we are noticing increasingly is that organizations are choosing to leave behind data in notes. They're saying, I can perfectly like run, say, a few servers in a cluster and allow for just people to access their old data in notes and uh, start afresh or uh, start with very minimal data in the, in the new platform. And in fact, there were a couple of end users who said they loved it when they actually could get a empty inbox. I mean, an empty inbox is something they had not seen in years together. And they said, hey, having an empty inbox would be great. All I need is just my calendar invites to be in, in place for them. So this also is something that uh, we are noticing that people are asking for, saying, can I leave behind? As long as they can access it, it's OK. Uh, again, as uh, Katie put it, the type of infrastructure, just make sure that your migration servers and all the different servers that are needed are available. Uh, we do have a migration toolkit that's available to download. It does give a list of different types of uh, software and uh, servers that you need to set up and uh, for, for the entire migration. The other two are interesting stuff. One is the regulatory compliance. Now, we have seen European customers have this need that data from Europe stays in Europe. So their country data should be in the tenant uh, for Microsoft within the, the geographical locality. And uh, if this comes up too late, or you kind of planned it out completely, and then it just kind of jumps up, then it takes time to sort some of these out. It, it helps upfront to design or define some of these regulatory compliance requirements and discuss it with Microsoft right upfront so that it would be very easy to set up your tenant. And the last one is coordination. I did touch upon it earlier as well. One of our customers, um, every planning done, they said, oh, we are all ready to go, and then hadn't informed the network team of the different ports that had to be open, and that costed nearly two weeks because any port to be open goes through a whole bunch of uh, approvals. And then they take some time to verify and things like that. So I think two, three weeks were just lost because that coordination hadn't been done. Similarly, with the service desk, I know the health desk team members have to be onboarded ahead of time, especially when you're doing stage, because somehow you forget that the first set of pilot users who have been moved also need support. So the support team members have to be uh, onboarded or like should be on with this entire plan right from the time your pilot is getting started. So that's something that I want to leave you with in terms of planning for timelines. And as I just uh, said, um, for a very large organization which is moving uh, from completely from on-site nodes to Office 365, um, uh, they did go through it in about 18 months. Uh, whereas another company which had about, um, I think about 8,000 users, managed to complete it in about six, seven months is what roughly. So that just gives you a rough idea of what, what you can see. Okay, Scott, let's do a third poll also to just make sure that our audience is awake. 
Okay, great. We got uh, one poll left, and then we'll have a feedback uh, form shortly. This poll is, which aspect of migration is the most challenging? Which one do you think will be the most challenging for you? Deciding the migration strategy, getting stakeholders to buy in, avoiding end user disruption, impact to the to large number of apps dependent on mail, or shortage of skilled project resources. So everyone is slowly waking up. Half of us have, have voted. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> and we're almost at 75% completed. Let's get over 80 and then I'll share the results. So we just need a, a few more votes in and we'll share the results. Okay, here we go. Results are coming up on the screen. So 46% um, think that deciding the migration strategy will be the most challenging. 23% getting stakeholders to buy in. 85% of course, avoiding end user disruption and 69% uh, dis impact on the apps that are dependent on mail, and only 8% think there's a shortage of skilled project resources. Because, of course, this audience is very smart. <laughs> All right. Mm -hmm. very, very interesting. Uh, and, and for sure, that I think uh, the, the impact on the end users is something that ID always uh, worries about. You know, you don't really want uh, the CEO to find that, hey, I'm not able to access my email today. That's something that's like nightmarish anyway. Um, so, before we go on, um, just one quick uh, aside, after people migrate, you know, what we typically end up happening is, you know what, yeah, my email is migrated and when, when is this complete, this project is complete, okay, people are able to access their emails, they make sure that, uh, you know, typical things like ability to uh, send, uh, receive emails and uh, calendar invites and things like that, it's all completed, it's working pretty well and people are comfortable and quite immediately they say what next, what, what, can, what can we get more and some of these are what we see typically coming up uh, from an office Square perspective, people want to collaborate. People have heard about groups and they say, oh, you know what, I, I have heard of this feature called groups, can I use it? Or have heard of like, you know, we can collaborate using Teams, can I use it? So these are, these are quite common. And we also see requests to migrate uh, typical document libraries, typical discussion forums and things like that. They say, can I just move them over to Office 365 because now I would like to work on them where I have my emails too. And uh, even though it's usually kicked off as a separate project, but Skype is something that people really want to use because uh, they start uh, uh, looking at whether they can bring in their PSTN integrations and things like that. Or can I start using Skype more to communicate within the organization between different loca locations, etc. And lastly, we also see, though it comes much later, not immediately, people will start looking at building applications using SharePoint. And quite often what happens is when there's a migration project planned for, there is a hold, right? Say, hey, I don't want you guys to do anything on the Notes platform anymore. Don't build me new applications or don't get ask me for uh, new team rooms and things like that. And suddenly that, uh, that group wakes up and says, now that the new platform is there, can I do these things? Uh, that, that also comes up. And much more importantly, people want to integrate, especially things like uh, customer service, uh, either Remedy or ServiceNow or something like that. Uh, they would like to integrate it, deeper integrations, especially with email and uh, CRM. So whatever with the CRM, whether it's Salesforce, etc., uh, they try to, in on, on the Microsoft Dynamics as well, and see how they can bring it together with Office 365 to kind of make it uh, do much better. So one of the uh, key things that you guys should plan for is also this what next. And one of our customers we've seen is did not open out all the functionality at the same time. They decided to phase things out. They were very tightly controlled in terms of the Office 365 functionality that was opened up. And that kind of helped 
quite a bit in terms of uh, end user adoption from the from the different uh, teams. Okay, I know uh, it's about 45 minutes since we started, and before we, I do have a couple of more slides to work on, but you guys have taken time and um, listened so far, and we really would like to hear your feedback because that helps us become better and we can make sure that we bring up more quality webinars also on ongoing webinars. So if you could share your feedback, I think the, the link is shared on your chat. That will be very helpful. That's correct, uh, Guy. Uh, so if you open up your GoToWebinar control panel, open up the chat section, I've just placed the link in there. Uh, it's a short little survey, and if you complete the survey, then uh, you get the migration kit for free. What better uh, what better motivation is there than that? So it's just a few questions. Super. Just giving a couple of more seconds before I move on to the next one. Okay, so we did see a lot of people talking about end user disruption and how they can make sure that people are adopting. So we have a short framework, and uh, as I said, the next uh, we will have an additional webinar coming up on specifically about adoption. But to give you an idea, have a strategy in place. Right, Epson, we talked about the uh, change management and communication plan. Have an adoption plan in place have a strategy in terms of how are you going to make sure that your end users are going to be um, onboarding very quickly. One of our customers decided to, uh, in each of their organization locations, they picked the senior most and they had a short session. I think it was part of their town hall or one of those meetings. They, they invested about 10 minutes to talk about uh, the fact that they were going to move to Office 365 and why it was important and what uh, the person, the, the, the senior uh, uh, leader liked about this entire aspect of it and that kind of boosted the uptake from the uh, other people in the organization. Stuff like this, but it has to be thought through, a complete strategy has to be evolved on it. Prepare for it and especially prepare your um, your team, the different teams that are going to be involved in it, especially the things like you now your service desk, if you are, if you have a governance council that has to be managed in terms of what data can go in, what data should not go in, how are you going to use things like OneDrive? It's better to prepare about that. Enable your, you know, it's typically if you see adoption the way it happens, and I'm sure all of you are familiar with it. There will be a few people who are really good at it. These are your star users. They just jump in, they learn much more than what uh, even IT could have learned and they just absorb it so well. Enable them and enable them to go ahead and spread the word around the organization. And we talk about activation. Be very specific in terms of use cases that you would like people to adopt to. For example, you could say, um, I want to enable my entire sales team to collaborate using OneDrive and uh, Office by email in a particular way that kind of uh, makes them better and it's very easy because they are learning a skill towards a particular goal and then it happens much faster is what that we have seen and of course on a constant basis we need to sustain uh, overall the enthusiasm in and also keep adding little by little all the features and of course being on a on a cloud-enabled platform, features keep coming very, very quickly. So there is work both from an adoption perspective as well as from an IT perspective because you need to choose which of the features that Microsoft releases you want to make sure that your users are experiencing. So that's a, that's a very quick intro to the adoption of Office 365, and we do have a, a webinar coming up which will delve much deeper into it and specific ideas and insights around it. So I open it up. I think we have just about 10 minutes for questions. So to the audience, for any questions that you want to ask me or Katie. Okay, brilliant. Thank you, Guy. 
So if you do have a question, now is the time to uh, open up the GoToWebinar control panel, go to the questions area and key in your questions and I can read them. So we do have a few questions already keyed up and ready to go. Uh, and I th the first question is, we kind of touched on this earlier in the presentation, but it won't hurt to um, recap this. So what are the best tools to help in our office uh, uh, notes to Office 365 migration? Okay, I think we did uh, cover it to a certain extent earlier. Um, there are multiple tools, right? Uh, though, as Katie said, Microsoft recommends about four tools, uh, Binary Tree, Quest, and uh, Katie, what are the other two that Microsoft rec recommends? I think you must be on mute. Anyway, uh, Katie can answer the other two as well. But yeah, what it's, we have uh, seen, yeah. it, it's um, one from binary tree and second one is uh, Quest. Uh, now it is uh, Dell software, and then we have Bit Titan, and then we have Skykick. So these are the Microsoft uh, what is a free forward or recommends. Uh, in the market, uh, there are other uh, tools like uh, you know migration ways, Sys tools. So we could consider, uh, which depends on what kind of uh, migration options uh, you want to go for it. Perfect. So, and yeah, as Katie talked about earlier, um, after some of the tests, especially for the last two large migrations, it was binary tree that, uh, that was picked after multiple uh, different considerations, as you talked about throttling, the stability and uh, how overall it worked and uh, um, how well it was able to sync data because there was a coexistence period uh, between nodes was also running and then Office 365 people had been migrated and how well uh, the sync of free busy times and uh, the email flow and things like that work. So at least I think the last uh, few migrations, two large migrations was binary tree for that. Okay, brilliant. Um, next question. Um, is there a typical cost for a migration project? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, is there some, some magic number that they can kind of look for per user maybe? I know this is a complicated question because uh, migration can also cost based on the amount of data. So that can yeah. fluctuate. Yeah, I mean, so, I mean, if, if, typically I would laugh and say it depends, but anyway, uh, some of the factors that you would see definitely as Scott, uh, you said, the amount of data makes a difference. And uh, you should also consider, you know, the, the complexity overall, right? Because look at what are, the, what are the things that go into the cost. You have to set up the infrastructure, of course. Then you're going to have to, if you're going to have a long drawn process, then you will have both the license as well as maintenance of both the systems. You will have uh, nodes running, you will have Office 365 running for some time to come. Then you will have to uh, plan for the network bandwidth increases and things like that. Those will be adding up. The actual tools that you use, use as well, um, they will have uh, licenses and uh, they do depend depend uh, depending upon the sometimes it's number of users or what you want to do with the tools and things like that so they have cost and um, you also look at uh, things like your your core team that's going to be supporting right some of the times you will need an extended support of different uh, SMEs who are going to be helping you with this entire migration process and overall the project management cost as well. So I don't think it's easy for us to put a number and say, you know, per user, this is what it's going to be. Uh, quite often, um, we do see it kind of works out over a period of time, uh, especially for large organizations, because uh, once the pilot is done, we see that the actual migration process goes on pretty quickly 
and you will be able to kind of get a good ROI of the overall uh, cost. And as I said, it's a program. It's never, in most of the organizations that we have seen, it sometimes they actually like uh, take this particular project and make it into a CapEx entry as well. So hope that gives some kind of an idea. Okay, perfect. Yeah. Just to add a couple of uh, points here based on my uh, experience uh, with handling you know different large uh, customers with uh, uh, big user base it all depends upon uh, how well you plan everything together you know including setting up uh, you know piloting phase and deciding which uh, strategy you want to use and, and then uh, you know uh, how you want to plan the resources so m my last project it was delivered under budget so that's how it works out if you plan it very well okay awesome, Katie. perfect okay uh, we have several questions to go here um, Okay, we have apps that will remain in, in Lotus Notes during phase one, the mail migration, that we need to continue sending emails, et cetera. How do we handle, I mean, what's the best way to handle that? Uh, do we set up forwarding addresses in the person documents on the notes side? Any help would be appreciated. Kitty? Yep. So they have notes apps that are, they, you know, that are sending out emails. So how do they handle that during the migration? So it will be uh, there are a couple of options. So the simple and best way is to set up the uh, forwarding, or if if they still want to keep uh, the existing notes as it is. Uh, because if you set the forwarding, so it, it will behave differently in the notes. So you could actually do the coding in the notes and, and, and do something about that. So there are a couple of options in that uh, uh, method. Right. Uh, we've also seen one more case where uh, I think this particular case, uh, email, the notes uh, application is just sending out an email. And it could be either to uh, end user or to another application, uh, whatever it is. We also have seen a remediation happening, just making sure that um, the, uh, the link, the doc links or any of those are going in correctly. So they do check that the app, the way it's constructing the emails is of standard so that it will read right in the Office 365 platform so that we've seen that that, that happened. But again, um, how did it actually forward over? It was using a forwarding address. The other aspect, especially with respect to apps, is when you get an email. So if, let's say, like uh, you, you get an email to uh, sales at company.com and which actually is a trigger for the CRM application, then that has to be handled differently and then there is usually a remediation process for that as well, so that any email that now it would end up coming to Office 365, but how do you make sure that you root it into notes and then pick up the process from there if you're not moving the app to, to a different platform? So both these happen. Hope, hope that answers your question. Okay, perfect. Um, all right, what's the uh, next question is, what would you consider to be a large mail file? Um, I'm asking because we have uh, one gigabyte quota and the VPs have unlimited so they can be, you know, much, much more larger. We have seen um, something that was almost 40 gigs, 60 gigs, so not unknown. And yes, um, we've also seen like, you know, organizations even for the CEO limited to, uh, I think it was it was 500 MB or something like that. So both have happened. Um, Katie, have you seen bigger than that? I, I don't think I've seen anything bigger than, uh, I think the largest I have seen is probably about 50 gig. Yeah, there, there, there are some uh, old um, male users if they are using uh, uh, from lo uh, quite long, they may have 40 or 50 GB of, uh, of uh, mail files. So uh, the better way uh, is to uh, to handle such a big uh, 
mails is to you know we need to plan uh, separately for such a mailboxes uh, or, or do something uh, better way so that uh, you know they will not come into normal users uh, migration so i mean to say we could actually uh, treat it in a different way or uh, group it together such mailboxes and then and see how we can do so anything more than uh, say 20 30 gb is considered as an um, and in a bigger mails so, um, why now microsoft even provides 150 gb so so you could migrate it but it depends upon bandwidth and time yeah it, it will take time to do those large files um, I, I would say maybe a, a successful strategy is to uh, implement archiving <laughs> before the migration <laughs> yes <laughs> Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so or do some limit. cleanup uh, or before it, the migration. Or leave it back in notes, allow people to be able to use it and just pick up the email, see whatever they want and give them a clean mailbox in uh, Outlook. Yeah, that's true. Quick question uh, as follow up to this one. Uh, do the migration tools still charge uh, also for the data, the amount of data that's being migrated? <laughs> Yes, okay. it is. Um, it's 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 like uh, it works something like this. Uh, uh, if you if you go for a tool, uh, they consider average uh, of per mailbox. Based on that, uh, they will um, charge or do some licensing stuff. So they may say, okay, average you can have let's say 8 GB or 10 GB. So you can include bigger as well as smaller ones. Okay, perfect. Uh, here's an interesting question. Uh, while migrating, um, if you're migrating a part of the users or just a subset of the users, is there any integration between Skype and SameTime? Um, no, the, there is no such uh, the integration with the Skype and the uh, SameTime. The main reason why uh, we don't see that useful or not use such an integration uh, is that uh, it's all uh, about the charts. So it's, 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 it may be very important for some companies where they want to keep only the you know, chart messages for some legal purposes. So I'm not seeing such uh, cases where uh, they keep uh, legal. Maybe there are some companies they keep uh, the chart messages for legal purposes so for them uh, it makes sense uh, to explore something uh, f for integration or, or migration okay perfect that was a, a very interesting question <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. okay this question is about groups uh, will they need to recreate the mail groups um, and users in office 365 or you know to match what they have in notes or are, do the migration tools also bring over the groups? The migration groups will uh, bring over the groups. Uh, it's again uh, the same process uh, how you uh, schedule the uh, migration uh, of the user. So you need to schedule the migration of the groups or you could go for uh, uh, straight away creating the groups uh, in, in Office 365. Uh, it's a manual process, but uh, uh, it, it may be a good good option to explore some options because uh, uh, the Microsoft Office 65 provides uh, the dynamic groups. So you can you can explore some options uh, before creating all the manual groups. You could explore uh, dynamic distribution groups in Office 365, uh, which will give uh, you know better uh, option instead of uh, maintaining and doing uh, you know um, group management. So we could have automated groups in Office 365. Okay, brilliant. Um... Um, are there any other? Okay, so this is kind of a follow-up to that, um, specifically about binary tree. Um, are there other items that have to be manually created if you're using the binary tree product, such as mail groups or, um, I don't know, outside of groups, is there anything else that needs to be manually created? Um, no, except that... Uh... 
encrypted emails so there is some different process uh, it will not be uh, actually migrated but it can be migrated but there is uh, uh, if, if suppose if if the mailbox has an encrypted email so you need to send well in advance uh, information to the end users and say okay you have uh, a, you know uh, encrypted emails uh, and if you want to decrypt so you please click on link and then it will decrypt but uh, the question here is that do you really want to decrypt uh, these emails because uh, you have encrypted it for some reason so it's uh, very tricky and you need to decide uh, uh, based on the scenario and uh, you know how you want to proceed with such things so apart from that uh, the binary tree will give all the options for uh, migrating uh, from nodes to office list okay perfect okay well we're at the end of the questions we did go over time just a little bit but uh the questions were very uh very relevant and uh, very useful for um everyone to hear the answers to so appreciate everyone who submitted questions and uh, guy and kt thank you so much for preparing this uh, getting some positive feedback already from the participants that they really enjoyed the topic and found it very useful so I'll, I'll turn the time back over to you, Guy and Katie, for the last words. Thanks, Scott. Um, really appreciate all the audience for the attending today, and uh, hope you did uh, derive some specific value uh, out of uh, this session and get an idea of how you could plan so that you can have a hassle-free migration. Um, have a good day. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye.